delegates it's uh it's a pleasure to be here with you my name is julian say i am a former finance professional and now a professional portrait photographer um, i'm joined here with shannon kalayana mitt from from thailand um i hope you've been enjoying the hpair conference so far it's it's i'm really looking forward to um uh sharing the story of, of shannon here with you today um so Shannon is a successful entrepreneur who studied in the US and in Thailand. She followed that by uh, working at PwC um, and at Lehman Brothers before starting several companies, including a women's e-commerce platform in Southeast Asia, which raised $50 million um, uh, and pioneer, was a pioneer in championing social impact uh, in business in that region. Um, she's one of uh, also she's also one of the notable female founders in Southeast Asia to exit from a venture, and was awarded the United Nations uh, Women's Leadership Award 2020 in Thailand. Um, in the last few years, she's been working uh, as a VC and in the 5G arena. Welcome, Shannon. Hello. Hi, Julian. Thanks so much. Very very happy to be here and happy to meet everyone. Great, great. Um, how are things in, in Bangkok at the moment? It's okay. I think the rest of the world is opening up, uh, but Bangkok is still on lockdown. So you guys have people in the States, LA, New York, Europe, everyone's out and about, and I'm still stuck at home. So yeah, <laughs> no end great. in sight yet. Well, it gives, gives, gives you a bit of time to, to speak to us and speak to all our wonderful delegates uh, at HPA. So, um, <laughs> uh, so your, your story is absolutely fascinating, Shannon, and um, you are a fascinating character as well. Um, as I mentioned, Sh uh, Shannon is, have been, is a successful entrepreneur, and uh, uh, but life has, hasn't always been full of successes, and we will find out how she dealt with all of that um, over the next hour. And we're looking forward to hearing any, any of your questions as well um, about uh, for Shannon. So do share those into the uh, Q and A, uh, and we will uh, look forward to getting to those. So uh, Shannon, you, you started off. Uh, you were born in uh, the United States, in 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 on oh, the West Coast, Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Um, you followed that up with uh, time in two very uh, startup startup uh, related cities in Cupertino. Mm -hmm. uh, any any anybody in the audience know where uh, the relevance of Cupertino? Which company is there? It is, um, of course, Apple. Um, you then had time in Fremont. Um, which company is, is there at the moment? That's Tesla. Tesla factory is over there. Um, you were then in Thailand um, in your teenage years. Uh, tell us a bit about 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 that time. I think you uh, you had a sort of identity crisis um, in that in that period, being from Thailand and America, and then going back to Thailand. <laughs> the whole thing. Tell, tell us tell us about that, Shannon. Yeah, thanks for that, Julian. I mean, when I when we were talking earlier, you told me I was trying to ask like where the delegates are from. And a majority of them are either Asian heritage, born and raised in the States or around the world, or vice versa, where um, maybe there are people from the States or the Western world who want to go to Asia. Um, so I, I get I understand that there's a bit of both. And there's a lot of issues that come with, you know, having that uh, a lot of pros and cons of, as well as being, you know, from two different cultures and exactly what you said. So yeah, my story um, today, I know a lot of people have already started listening to more work related things, but as you and I discussed, we're going to go back and forth between, you know, Asian culture, some challenges and failures and then we're going to do a bit of life and then we're also going to do a bit of work so so yeah just so people know that it's not all work today um but yeah so the theme is resilience and we're going to focus on that um 
So yeah, I was born in the States, uh, like you said, Portland, Oregon. Um, my dad and mom are Thai. Um, when I first moved to, um, well, sorry, when I was born in America, people were like, oh, you're Thai. Uh, oh, you're Taiwanese. And um, a lot of people might be laughing right now um, because I was talking to my Taiwanese friend and she was like, oh, you I love Thai food. Okay, so we're all Asian here. <laughs> Most of us know the difference. So yes, yeah, so I was born in America um, and then moved down to Cupertino uh, and then Fremont. And then when I was 12, my dad got a call um, to move back to Thailand. At that time, there's this thing called the reverse brain drain project where they were calling back all, my dad was, is an industrial engineer, my mom's a nurse. So they wanted to call all these um, professionals back to help the country. So, you know, we went back home, uh, we went back to Thailand. He went back to Thailand, I moved to Thailand at age 12. And um, yeah, what happened to me at that time was actually quite, weird um i experienced uh what did we call it that day reverse discrimination maybe so i look completely thai um but i don't act completely thai and i cannot speak thai and so at 12 i went through a bit of bullying uh, there were people who were talking about behind my back saying that i'm a fake like fake wannabe american when like, they're basically saying, oh, she looks high and everything, but why is she pretending she can't speak Thai? Anyway, it's, um, this was again, just so people know, 1990. Okay, so <laughs> I was 12 in 1990. You can figure out how old I am. But yes, there weren't too many people back in Thailand at that time. In fact, I even thought we rode to school on elephants. Um, my own ignorance, right? So. So yeah, I came back, uh, experienced a bit of um, bullying, uh, you know, somehow was the awkward and weird one and um, definitely identity crisis, definitely a culture clash because I didn't understand anything being in Asia. But somehow I think one thing that, that came to me was that, you know, I am weird. Uh, I am not normal. I mean, if you had to do like the whole school, I, I'm not like any of these people. And so at, I don't know what happened, but there was this one light bulb that went up and was basically like, okay, own it. So I'm just going to be the weirdest person there is. So I ended up befriending some misfits. In fact, we even had a gang at 12, we're 12. Okay. And uh, we talked about it and we just owned it. And then, you know, I didn't have to worry so much anymore being accepted or anything because I just owned the fact that I was weird. Anyway, fast forward um, at age, so that was 12, so that's sixth grade. Then in 10th grade, um, here I am in Bangkok. I went through high, uh, middle school and everything and I fell in love. Uh, it is my first boyfriend at age 15. Um, he broke my heart. And so um, I wrote a business plan to my dad to go back to the States because I was saying that I was losing my English. My dad said, yes. So I went back to the States um, and I was in a little town called Benicia, which is in the like near Marin, Napa, Sonoma Valley in, in California. And then I got reverse, reverse discrimination because they were like, oh, you're too whitewashed, Shannon. And so, um, I don't know if you know this, but like back in the day, this is like, okay, this is what, 1993, um, 90s hip hop was going on. And um, I mean, I didn't know anything about, I knew hip hop, but I didn't know the culture and, and how it was to be an American born Chinese or American born Thai. So I got the reverse, reverse discrimination coming back. And I was like, oh my God, I just can't win here, you know? So um, went through went through high school, also befriended some really great friends um, and just, you know, went through high school as it is. Um, another segue is uh, that same boyfriend that broke up with me in Thailand decided that um, he wanted me back and I, and we were talking. And so I wrote another business plan to my dad to come back to Thailand. And at this time, 
this was 1996, this is 12th grade, I basically said that the reason why I wanted to come back to Thailand and Asia is because I could foresee that Asia is going to be the next place for the economical boom for the rest of the world for the next decade. Little did anybody else know that was really just me wanting to go back to my boyfriend. Uh, spoiler alert, I actually moved back. He already had a girlfriend. That's the last time I did anything for men. So, um, Yes, that's the love saga. One of the reasons why you and I talked about this and why we should talk about this was because a lot of people might be going through their first love. A lot of people might be balancing the act between, um, you know, what's practical and logical um, decisions to make versus love decisions. You know, you're in that kind of area where you're in high school and college and everything. And, and there are all these things that come up into play. And um, I'm just saying that it's normal. Everybody else goes through that. There's a lot of um, decisions you have to make. Um, do I regret any of those decisions? I don't. I really did like going back to the States. I think that if I, if I was in Thailand in my international school here, I would have become a different person. Uh, I would have not been as been independent. Um, in Thailand, we have you know, nannies and maids and everything over there. I just had to do my own laundry and everything, right? And then do I regret coming back to Thailand at the end of the day? I don't because um, at that time, the other thing that justified me moving back was, do I, somebody asked me that, do I wanna be a small fish in a big pond, AKA America, or do I wanna be a big fish in a small pond, a, AKA um, Thailand, right? And so I knew that I stood out in, in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm weird that my ideas are out there. I have the best of both worlds between Thailand and America. Um, and then, you know, I was just going to go for it and, and, and I wasn't going to regret. So that's how I moved back to Thailand. And I've been based in Thailand ever since all my jobs that we'll talk about later has been based from Thailand, but global um, and everything. So, yeah, so I guess that's when I moved back. And then I went to college um, and I did finance. Uh, with, a, with a minor in marketing. Um, I have to tell you, uh, there's a lot of people here that are college, people are in college right now. So uh, I was not a great student. In fact, um, a lot of my, a lot of my college really focused on extracurricular activities. I was head cheerleader. Uh, <laughs> of course, of course. I, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I was head cheerleader. I organized um, concerts, events, sponsorships. I just did a lot of things that were just activities, sports and, and whatnot. Um, I didn't pay too much attention in class. I definitely went and, and talked to a lot of the other universities and friends. I did do a lot of um, partying, which also affected my school. Having said that, um, a lot of my friends actually graduated uh, in th three years and a half, I, because of my discipline um, and not going to school as much, I graduated in four years rather than three and a half. So, you know, there are things to pay for it. Um, the one thing I did learn from college was that, um, well, one, major culture shock. I was going to a Thai school this time around, but but international program, right? But Thai school, the top, one of the top schools here in Thailand. And, um, and I definitely had to figure out the lay of the land. Um, especially with being Thai. Having said that, after that, my main challenge was, like a, a lot of people here, is how was I going to get a job with my grades not being so great, right? So um, I interned for my second year and third year and fourth year. And I interned, luckily, at PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. I didn't even use my transcript. Um, I basically read a newspaper article, yes, there were newspapers then, um, article about a, a big conglomerate doing a debt restructuring, and when I went in to talk to the partner, it turns out that they were actually the, the, the consultant in charge of that one, and so it was a great kind of like segue. Um, I eventually got hired by PwC when I completed the internship, um, even though my grades were really bad. Um, and they were not hiring undergraduates at that time. Uh, I basically got to prove that, again, this now, year is 2000, um, and the internet just came by. So at first, you know, as an intern, you Xerox a lot. 
uh, I basically was able to do some of their Xeroxing and kind of digitize it and whatever. And I was able to find a lot of things on the internet for them. Again, this is year 2000. So, you know, it's a really crappy kind of like stuff that you have to do, but you know, you make the most of it. And then, and then they cut somehow saw the, the benefit that I would bring. So they hired me. Um, and that's actually how I got into Pricewaterhouse. And I'm very fortunate for that. Um, same thing with Lehman Brothers. I had um, interned at a uh, subsidiary of Lehman Brothers here in Thailand. At that time, this is the Asian crisis. What happened was we, Lehman had to buy a bunch of like debt, bad debt from all the banks here. And so, um, you know, I could read and write Thai. And one of the things that I tell a lot of Asian friends or anybody in any language actually, is that don't forget to, to learn how to read and write your own language as well. So I had a, a lot of friends at that time who graduated who didn't get jobs. And again, maybe it's relevant now during COVID, right? But um, they didn't get jobs and they were really looking for the person who could do the most things with the most skill set. So for me, they were better than me in school, but they could only read and write English or they were better than me in school and they could they didn't know how to network. They didn't know how to do presentations. They didn't know how to, you know, model. Actually, I didn't know how to model either. But um, I had other things that I brought to the table. Um, and so because of that skill set, I was able to read and write. I mean, I still write like a 10th grader in Thai, but I could read contracts. I can read, you know, like um, legal docs. I cannot draft a governmental letter. But, you know, these are things that you kind of still bring to the table. So if there's anybody out there, you know, during these times, um, do try to learn it and, and don't think it's too late. There's people who learn languages at like 30 or 40, right? So um, do that because you can actually have the best of both worlds. So anyway, so yeah, I guess my point is um, I was at PwC, I was at Lehman. The one thing that um, I do remember during those times is I'm glad that I had the three, four years to actually really, really get my foundation right in terms of um, banking, finance, understanding how to work with people, different agencies we had to work with. We had to work with real estate, lawyers, accountants. We had to work how you coordinate that, how you project manage, how you can do a deck, right? A right way you do formatting for a presentation, how you run models. Like basically it's um, investment banking or consulting 101. And those are the things that I really, really got out of my first three years. So if anybody is in the position where they're lost and confused and you don't know and you're bored of your job, in fact, uh, one of the great things that I learned from that time was not really what I'm good at, but really what I suck at. I was really, really bad at, I was okay at, at Excel modeling, but it was not, that, that wasn't my forte. I mean, I was better at deal chasing, uh, I was better at quantifying the, the opportunity, the deal structuring. Um, again, I, was, I wasn't great at the, the Excel to the point where other people are. Um, and at that time, you know, this is now 2004, I was like, okay, it's like been four years in, in consulting and banking. Like, what is it more that I, I feel like I've learned enough, but what was it I do next? I have no idea. So what I did was I paused. I did a SWOT of myself. I figured out what my goal, well, I tried to at that time. Again, I think I was what, 23 or 24. Uh, I tried to figure out what my goals are long-term. And I felt that it, being in banking, I didn't get to build in my social impact, which was a big, big thing for me. And it was just so cold hearted. It's okay, deals are fun and exciting, but you know, I just didn't have that social impact. Okay, money was good, right? International traveling was great. Um, independence, I was still a minion, right? I'm still like 24. I, I can't really have my independence yet, uh, which also goes into decision-making process. So I, I don't have that kind of autonomy yet. Um, and then, so what is it that I wanna do next? And, and I didn't know this back then, but really what I was describing is Ikigai. You know how there's this, um, I don't know if people have seen this, but there's a, if you Google it, there's a Venn diagram for, things of uh, like do what the world needs, do what you love, do what you can pay, be paid for, do what you're good at. I, th I think that's the thing. And so at the end of 2004, um, I decided I was gonna quit Lehman. I did this kind of um, analysis on myself. And then I'll pause here because then it just leads to what I did in the next section of my life. 
Uh, this is just so fascinating, uh, Shannon. I uh, didn't, didn't know that you were head cheerleader at school, but um, <laughs> can, we can all absolutely, absolutely imagine, imagine that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you were fantastic at that. <laughs> um, so before we just move on to uh, from your sort of early life and studies and uh, early working career, um, just wanted to ask you a couple, a few, uh, a few short questions, which might be of uh, of value to the to the um, the delegates. So um, you're you're obviously very driven, and you you want to get things done to achieve something. What are three things that you find maximizes your efficiency and your work output, which the audience should should perhaps know? So um, maximize my efficiency and actually turns my head on every day. Like it sets me every day. Um, one, yoga. I recently discovered yoga. And uh, even though I did gymnastics a long time ago, yoga, is, it actually takes a bit more discipline. So um, yoga actually really sets my mind in terms of cardio and, uh, and all of that stuff. Two, um, and intention. And then two... I have this matcha green tea that I drink every morning. It's a shake. It, it like gives me the right dosage of caffeine. It's like, it's better than coffee. Um, three, uh, electronic music. Like that's the only thing that gets me in the zone to actually like work. Um, yeah, I guess those, oh, and then, you know, if you want to do like a time helper thing, nowadays I've learned to actually block uh, time instead of doing meetings back to back, I actually block time to be like, okay, work on this project, this deck by this, and it's like, like three hours. So when I start to block things, which include friends too, which include like kids as well, and I put blocks of these things, it's like meetings, it's actually helped me manage my life a lot more. Great, great. So, so try that out, Delegates. Yoga, uh, matcha green tea, electronic music, and um, time blocking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you, you need to do that uh, uh, very, very much so given that you are uh, a mother of two, two babies, which will come, come to later. Um, and then after, after a long day at work or a long week, uh, what's one thing that helps you to recharge and maybe the uh, delegates could try out as well? I don't think it's a healthy choice though, <laughs> what I do when I, eat, <laughs> when I unwind. Um, I have to say, okay, before I answer that one, um, I've always not taken myself too seriously where I, I can't have fun. If I'm not having fun and if I don't actually have the play in my life, I'm going to be a very, very unhappy person, which makes everyone around me unhappy. So, um, so when I say this, take it with a grain of salt. Um, so after a week, I do like to enjoy my time having a drink or two or three or four. <laughs> so I do like doing that. And usually it's to catch up with friends. Um, basically, I, I completely don't pick up my phone. I don't answer like messages in terms of work. I have to cut it off. If not, um, I'm just always working. And, and I don't like that. I need to have buckets of things of what I do at a certain time. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think the the point your point about having fun and play is just so important. Absolutely, so important. Um, and and also, not just in the outside of work life, but even in, in the even in work life. Yeah. Um, when you're working, working with colleagues, um, with partners, uh, I think fun, having fun and playing is uh, is also so important. Uh, and I'm sure that you 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 in the office environment are very very fun and very playful. It is, it is. If not, it wouldn't be, yeah, enjoyable every day. <laughs> um, so moving on to, to the, ne the next stage of your career. Um, so after uh, PwC and Lehman Brothers, um, I think you found your, your path. Um, you had, a, had, had certain times where you were a little confused as well. Um, you became a manager for the first time uh you became you were single for a while i don't know how how this is what your dating life is it so features into this so much but uh but but love this um you were broke for a little bit you felt lost 
um, yeah. tell, tell us about the next period. Yeah, I mean, I, I bucket my life into like three main parts, right? And so we just heard about the early part, which is like building foundation and identity and or trying to build, find identity. This part like is more the trying to find my product market fit like trying to find what I like and what I'm not good at and what where I'm going and trial and error. It, it was basically a long period of trial and error. Um, and, and there were definitely, I'm not going to lie, um, it's, it was actually really, really painful at some times. Um, and some of them were really re rewarding too, but I think there was a lot more pain than reward at that at that time. Um, so yeah, so just to continue the story after, so now I'm about like 24, 25. Um, and then what happened? Oh, okay. So uh, at this point I'm single again. Um, my then boyfriend broke up with me again. Uh, this seems to happen a lot, no, no. Anyway. Um, so uh, I was just single. Then I started, um, oh, I know, the tsunami happened. And um, me and my friends, um, the Asian tsunami flew down and did a whole one year project. Cause I said, I wanted to do social impact, right? So this thing happened. I'm not saying it's a, a great thing, but it was probably one of the most defining moments in my life that I just really felt, um, that I was making a difference or doing something. So my my uncle was uh, governor of Phuket at that time, which is an island in the south of Thailand. So we all flew down, 20 people canceled our Christmas vacation. We did everything from helping corpses um, all the way to scholarships to, to um, identify. One of my friends had to run the graveyard. The other one had to um, separate body parts, apologies, anybody here. Um, but then we started to do other things such as we built schools, we um, built boats, we found um, this one village that we took care of. And that was kind of like probably my first entrepreneurial venture, but it was definitely much more like philanthropic and whatever. I had to raise funds, I had to do plans, I had to bring sponsors in, blah, 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 and all that other stuff. And I had a great team who were all like um, for it. The downside was, and so of course I felt amazing, right? The downside was I didn't make any money. I actually used my bonus from Lehman to pay for all the flights and everything. So I didn't actually use the sponsorship funds. I didn't know that other charities had like a management fee. I didn't do that because uh, I wasn't a legit NGO anyway. Um, so, you know, remember the, the kind of like things I always go back and I think, okay, um, did I have autonomy? Yes, I did. Independence? Yes, I did. Did I, you know, social impact? Yes. Did I make money? No. How could I live if I don't make money, right? So I went through the checklist of things that I liked and didn't like. Um, and so I'm like, okay, fine. I can't do this. I handed, I found an NGO, handed it over. They did the rest of the cash distribution. That was fine. And then I applied to the UN. I got rejected because I didn't have a master's degree. And which again, I was telling you, it's funny because now I speak for the UN, but uh, they didn't want to hire me back then. So then I'm like, okay, what do I do? What do I do that there's still a mission? So I applied to a company named Singha Beer because I'm Thai and yes, they sell beer, but I was thinking they were gonna come out with new lines with like Thai products, Thai instant you know, products and whatever. So what I wanted to do was bring Thailand to the world. And, um, and it was a global position. I was number three in command at the international division, youngest and only girl. Um, and at that time was I 27, 27, 28, I forget. It was a great job. Um, I flew around the world. I, I took care of celebrities like Vijay Singh. Um, I went to Manchester City, secure, did the deal between Tuxin and, and Manchester City football team. Th there were so many great things. The, the downside, the reason why I quit was um, I was preparing a merger and acquisition deal for the um, for the management, and there was this one it, all the way to the board already. The, there's this. I was like, you know, this M and A works because X, Y, and Z, and then basically everything was going to go forward already. Then this 60, 70 year old lawyer on the board goes, "Hey, but if it ain't broke, why fix it?" Why are we changing things? And so the whole team decided no. And I got so pissed off. So I walked out, I quit. Um, so for me, 
the issue, I'm not saying quit every single thing. I had stayed there for three, four years already. Um, but for me, that was kind of the last straw because again, back to the point, did I have autonomy? No, I was never going to own that company. It's a family business. That's never going to happen. Two, did I make money? Yes, that's fine. But did I make massive amounts of money? No. Did I help mission the mission? Yes, kind of, but um, it wasn't the kind of mission that I wanted to help, right? So that was Singha. So I decided that at that time that I was finally going to start my own business. And my business that I started was in TV and media. Basically, we brought in um, TV formats to other TV stations here. I even did a TV show. I was in front of the camera and back of the camera. I worked with my friends who were models, celebrities. We actually did um, a hip hop and reggae concert with 10,000 people, which is a lot in Thailand. Um, and yeah, so, so this one media company I had um, had its ups and downs. I definitely did this was a failure obviously all in all um the successes were good but um for the first time a partner of my circumvented me went behind my back and tried to do a deal without me some of the legal things i didn't have it covered even though you know we come from finance and, and business school but you know when you only have little amount of funds what kind of hires can you hire what kind of lawyers can you hire so it's my first kind of like wake up call to that kind of thing um the first time manager, the other uh, thing that I learned during those years was um, at Singha, I became a first time manager at this level. And I was working with Thais this time around, not, you know, international like us. And, and, and that with um, this advisory contract that I had done to build a TV station from scratch, um, I learned very uh, abruptly that my style of uh, management was not the right way for ties. And I was a bit too aggressive. Um, I was, I think there was a lot of ego in, in it. Um, I wanted to get things done, but perhaps, you know, I thought about like the, the ends justify the means rather than trying to get it and work together and make people accountable and get people teamwork and get their ideas to actually come up with a solution. Um, that was uh, something that I learned during that time, especially when I got fired from my first job. So I, there was the advisory company that I was telling you about that I built a TV station with a team from scratch. And that was actually going to be like, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, and then they fired me. So I really had to lick my wounds. And um, again, those five years were the whole span of time, I think was about seven, eight years um, on the, on the work side. I was definitely like losing. Um, I was not still lost and confused, didn't know where to go, didn't know what I was good at. In fact, I think I was worse it, than I had started out when I was at banking and, and Singha. But I was like, what am I doing with my life? Then as you mentioned, yes, I was single. I was so single. So I was single for like seven years um, and the year, the age at that point that I had this rock bottom uh, depression, um, and it's the, the biggest one in my life so far. And again, I'm 43 and this happened at 29. So at 29, what happened was, um, maybe some women can relate here, you all, and Asians too, right? So you're thinking, okay, you're gonna have your kid at 35 and then you're working backwards then you have to be know this person for at least two, three years. So you have to meet somebody by 31, 32. And it's, I'm 29 and I'm so single. And for 70 years, I've been so single. So what am I gonna do? So, so of course I'm like, oh, so I'm like, aha, uh -huh. egg bank. Okay, so, so I went, because if you do an egg bank, right? It basically um, um, extends your lifetime of finding someone, right? And so either you put your eggs in a bank and then you leave it there and then maybe there's like science by the time you're that age that will, you know, if you're older, that will make that better, uh, that will make uh, it safer um, to have a kid or there's surrogacy, whatever. So I was looking at options like that. And then as I was telling you, this is kind of crazy, but this is how my brain works, right? I'm very creative in, in thoughts. Um, so I actually did look at um, adopting a kid <laughs> at that time um, for in preparation that if I don't hit the 31, 32 threshold, then you know, I'm gonna start my adoption process. 
And so, and so I had looked at um, adopting a Japanese kid. I don't know why, um, because they're so cute. And um, FYI, you have one parent has to be Japanese to be able to adopt a Japanese kid. Anyway, entertainment value. Okay, so I guess my point is during those lost years, three, three main things. One, work, trial and errors, um, still trying to find it. Two, um, love, completely nothing there, um, trying to look for other creative ways. Um, three, uh, the process that I had, I, was, I didn't know it, but I was actually cultivating my lost process. Like when I get lost and confused, what do I do about it? How do I get up again? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, and I think I told you this when we were talking, Julian. Um, I actually woke up one day and everything was just so bad. And I was like, why am I living on this? I would never, I'm not thinking suicidal. I'm just like, why, what, what's the reason for my existence? There is none. Like, why am I here? So I woke up the next day and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be one of those people that, you know, don't have a story to say or something on my tombstone will say that, oh, that girl that did nothing, you know? So I got up and then I packed a bag. I went to the beach um, by myself. Um, it was like a six hour trip. And then that was the beginning of me finding my lost and confused process of what I do when I'm lost and confused. And the main gist of it is, is that I go be by myself on a beach. I bring a sketchbook. I do a SWAT on myself. I figure out strengths, weaknesses, blah, blah, blah. I do that Ikigai diagram it was a long time ago, but basically what is it I liked and didn't like about my last job? What do I like and don't like about my new job? And then um, I also do this thing, which is like a, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I'm like a 10 year planner. So at 29, I was thinking to myself, okay, at 35 or 40, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna be? And then it's those main images that actually put me on this, when you work backwards, then those are the things that actually put me on the path on where to go. Because sometimes you can't see what's right in front of you. You just have to go project and then work backwards, right? So for me, the SWAT, the what I like and don't like, um, one and the the ten year, fifteen year projection, and then working backwards, and then last, and then you know there are MBTI tests, trying to find yourself, and personality and Gallup Strengths Finders test, all these things to do it, um, and then, and then the last thing is I actually so I did a vision board as well, so I guess a lot of like self discovery at that time, but the main just is um, it's okay to be lost. Um, and you just have to forgive yourself and give you that time. And, and luckily after that process, I didn't have everything there, but luckily after that process, I actually felt that right after that, that actually kickstarted me to my next stage, which, um, helped me so much in, in everything else I do. So I guess. Oh. Fantastic. And, and for those, um, who, who don't know what a SWOT analysis is briefly, uh, how would you describe that? So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And threats are like bad habits, right? Like opportunities are you could do this if you do this or something, right? Um, strengths and weaknesses are, are just very self-explanatory. But you have to be crucial. Um, one thing that I also found that helped was I would go online and I would look at values. And then I would circle, like there's like 50 people values. Or I would circle the values that actually I... I like and 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 something that calls out to me. And then after you circle all of them, you actually see a pattern of where your life is going and where your brain is thinking. And so at that time, I had again a lot of social impact. This time it was more equality, empowerment, um, not so much environmental. And again, everybody has different themes at different times. I believe that everybody has blocks of times, like chapters. Right. You can't you can't what one person was asking me this the other day. I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing in my life. They're like 26. And I'm like, dude, like I'm 43. It took me three iterations to get to where I am. Right. So we're only on you're only on block two. So give yourself time. And I think that's just the main thing. Just be aware when you're lost. You know, you're not one reassurance is you're not going to be lost forever. You're not that person. It's not perpetual. If you, you know, it might be a while, it might take a, a long time, but if you're working on it, your radar is out there, you'll eventually figure it out. And so um, it just, it doesn't end there. 
Great, great. Appreciate that, um, Shannon. Very, very wise words for, for our listeners. Um, uh, and M MBTI, I just wanted to, uh, to mention is a Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, so you, you mentioned you using a, doing a personality test to try and understand yourself. Uh, let me try and guess which type you are. Uh, uh, so E, S, uh, F, uh, tell, tell us which one it is. ENTJ. ENTJ, okay. Yeah. ENTJ, I can't remember which one that is, but, um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah. those of you who don't know what MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator is, um, go check it out later. It's um, quite, quite interesting. Um, okay, so th thanks for, that, for that, that, that second stage. We're gonna move on to the final stage in, of your career in a second. Um, uh, the last of the stage. Um, uh, just going to do three, a uh, few quick fire questions again before moving on to um, your time getting tech, getting into tech um, with Lazada, uh, Moxie, Arami, uh, the UN Women, and uh, Shark Tank on on TV in Thailand, and your current stuff, five G. Um, what are three things you couldn't uh, live without in terms of physical object? Oh God, I'm I'm just going to start to repeat myself now because you know I, when I found this solution, it really worked. So I have to have my yoga mat. I I need to have my electronic music just because it focuses me. Um, and hmm, what's another one? Um, forget what I said last time. Uh, I'm not a very materialistic person. Oh, okay. My laptop still need to work or my phone, but laptop. Okay, great. And then um, what are three countries that you, you would want to visit? I want to. Uh, I want to go to Cuba. I want to go to Jordan. Mm -hmm. I need to do more of Europe, like the Portugal, you know, all of that side where you guys are at, like Switzerland, all of that side. So, um, yeah. Oh, great. Well, looking forward to welcoming you in, in, in Europe uh, whenever borders open out of Thailand. Um, so, yeah, so let's move on to the final, the final set before we get into questions. There, I know there, there are quite a few questions from the audience. Um, by the way, uh, Shannon and I are going to have a, a clubhouse session sort of starting half an hour after this in case you guys would love to um, speak more directly with Shannon. And we'd love to actually hear your voices as well. It's kind of strange to just talk among us, among us, and see texts coming in. It'll be so so nice to hear uh, your own voices uh, in in wherever you happen to be. So um, I get those questions ready. Uh, so yeah, it, let, let's talk about the, the 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 next stage of your career, um, getting into tech. Um, working in, in a VC, uh, Shark Tank, Thailand, and, and what you're currently doing, 5G. Okay, and on a time check, we have about 10 minutes, five minutes for this part before Q&A, or? Uh, probably, probably about okay. uh, seven, seven minutes before like we- wrapping. Okay, yeah, um, okay, I will be quick. So, lost and confused, okay, fine, went to the beach, actually met my um, now ex, ex um, but my boyfriend also fathered my children, um, which was a great thing, you know, after seven years of being single. Um, and then I still didn't know what to do in my career, came back to Bangkok. Uh, and then there was a LinkedIn, two ways, actually, my girlfriend, one of my best friends, uh, Patricia, from Lehman Brothers, um, she was like, hey, Shannon, like there's this job opportunity for a company named Rocket Internet. They're looking for ex-consultants and bankers. Um, I thought of you um, and it's for e-commerce. And I'm like, mm, what's really e-commerce? Like, um, yes, I'm in tech now. And yes, I was born, like, you know, I was raised in Silicon Valley, but I was actually terrified of tech. So, um, and then at the same time, LinkedIn came in and then same thing. So I went in, got hired. Um, and then, Laza so Rocket Internet, uh, for people who may or may not know it here, they're run by the Samware brothers, three brothers in Berlin. They have e-commerce and startups all over the world. Um, Zalando, Zalora, blah, blah, blah. They're in um, 
Africa, they're in Latin America, they're in Turkey, they're in everywhere. And so the one that they were starting here in Southeast Asia uh, was called Lazada. And Lazada is the Amazon of Southeast Asia. So it's, we don't have an Amazon. I mean, we don't really use Amazon here. So if anybody knows Lazada, that's the one that um, I joined. So as a second um, Thai employee there, and I was there, um, and, and this is my first, first uh, ever run-in with tech. What was fascinating about this was how um, they had this playbook of existing other e-commerce companies, how they scaled, how they hired people, how they built um, and, and did MVPs. And, and basically it's very different from the traditional how to build a business thing, like block by block, brick by brick. This one within like four, three months, I think, three months from the day I met and joined to the day that's up um, and running, um, the site was up and 200 people. So, um, so Lazada was my tra training ground, boot camp, um, a lot of tears. The culture was not great. Maybe you guys have heard. Um, but having said that, one of the best trainings sprints in, in for my career. Um, so anybody who ever wants to get into something, do your own business, try to do something like that, get a boot camp, go work for somebody like similar, you know, for a year or two, and then just start your own thing. So, so that helped me a lot. Then I decided that I wanted to start my own e-commerce. So I started, uh, me and my two partners started Moxie, which is a woman e-commerce. Uh, what it is, is it's just like Amazon, just like Lazada, but we cater to women. We actually still sell men's stuff, but the woman's the buying it, right? The, the girlfriend or the wife is buying it for their husband or, or son or whatever. So with that, what was really great, again, now we're talking about this thing, autonomy, I have autonomy because I'm a founder, right? Social impact, I decided to build in um, the whole women empowerment equality issue because in Asia, we, we do have a big issue about women empowerment. It's, it's, it's such a male-led uh, patriarchal society. And so I, I definitely wanted to bring this aspect into it. And so I got to build in my own social mission. Um, do I get paid well? Not in the beginning, but later on I was paid fine because I also have shares, right? Um, flexibility, you think that you have more flexibility as an entrepreneur, you don't, uh, you're just working all the time. But anyway, it just matched most of the requirements that I wanted. This is where it goes really fast. So at that time, I had m and into a group. Um, and then we did another M&A, total three M&As. They did one prior to me joining. Um, the third M&A that I did was with a um, Indonesian mothers and babies e-commerce. And so I had the Thai one, we had the Indonesian one, we merged. We, um, at that time, we picked up a lot of clout. CNN, Bloomberg was interviewing us. Um, I was the only, no, well, one of, there were many, one of the many, um, the very few women founders that were doing such a, you know, bigger startup that was getting a lot of um, news attention. Um, Eduardo Severin invested into us, who's, you know, the Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's um, ex counterpart. So th there was a lot of great things going our way, finally. Um, of course, it wasn't easy in the beginning. That's for maybe the clubhouse session. But um, long story short, um, was with Moxie, founded it, MA, partially exited in 2018. Um, then started finding my groove a bit more during that time. I became a better manager. This time around, I did a hybrid between the Asian side and the and the still being you know strong and, and firm side. And then um, the reason why I partially exited was because me and the co-founders, because remember the last MA, we actually didn't see eye to eye on our vision. And um, they felt that they could execute it at that point. It just uh, I became more silent, right? And so I partially exited. They only exited um, earlier this year, 2020. Um, so now it's a full exit. Having said that, during that time, didn't know what to do with my life. What did I do? I go to the beach again, write this spot, do the values. What am I going to do next? I have no idea. So I decided, and, and through some great mentors, um, they were like, you know what, Shannon, you got finance, you got tech, you got business, entrepreneurship, go be a VC. So um, Gobi Partners was actually one of my first investors at Moxie. It was great because they saw, you know, um, the benefit of women uh, founders, whereas some people just didn't, right? And so um, 
I decided to join Gobi. And Gobi, for people, if you guys don't know, it's an early stage uh, VC from China, but we're all the way, China, Southeast Asia, all the way to Pakistan. We run about $1.3 billion in AUM. Uh, we do everything from early stage all the way to B and C. We have 15 unicorns, some of them listed on stock market, some of them trade exit. Um, so, so it's a great uh, job. And then um, the Shark Tank people came knocking on my door. Um, actually, it came through a friend who was an, uh, another shark. Her name is Nishida Shah. She's, uh, she's a mogul in um, shipping here in Thailand, Thai Indian. Um, actually, she's Indian, but just born in Thailand, international school as well. Um, extremely bright. And, um, and she's like, hey, Shannon, we need more women on the show. Uh, you come from not just a family business, but you did it yourself. You know, from the from your you know ground up, uh, we they would love to have you. So got on Shark Tank, uh, was one of five six. There was still kind of some rotation. Um, that was fun. Um, more on that later. <laughs> um, and then you know, I was doing that for a while. Then last year, um, something just fell onto my lap. I was still enjoying my job at at, at Venture. I was kind of missing operations. Because I'm, you know, when you're a VC, you invest, you help, but then at the end of the day, I couldn't help but get frustrated when I can't do it myself. So um, that plus this opportunity where I got to uh, work with, so the Thailand, I don't know if anybody knows much about 5G, but 5G is, you know, a spectrum that's being auctioned off in places around the world. In Thailand, there's a government agency called National Telecom. So basically they didn't, um, they wanted help commercializing it. And so we got to be one of their exclusive partners. And so because of that um, opportunity, which is really an unfair advantage, and that's the only way that I would get into any kind of business anymore. If you don't stand out, if you don't have a competitive edge, if you cannot withstand competitors with billions of dollars, then I don't wanna do that business. I have to do something that I know I'm gonna rock it. I'm gonna kill it, I'm gonna do it right. And um, that's why I decided to jump into this. So today, um, today I am now working at 5GCT. I'm a CEO. Uh, I still wear another cap at um, Gobi Partners. I'm still active with UN Women. Uh, this time I'm work active in terms of not just the equality and empowerment of work things, but also um, on the technological and innovation side of things as well. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Shannon, this has been absolutely, absolutely fascinating to hear your journey, your story. You're, you're, you're really such a character. Um, uh, there, there are so many questions that have come in. We've got a uh, well, five minutes officially. Um, if you guys, uh, I don't know if you guys have ten minutes, just drop a note in the chat, and then uh, I'll do a little bit more question, a few more questions here. Um, but it, as I've just put into the chat that. Do copy that clubhouse link so you can um, join us in half an hour after this and we'd love to hear your voices um, and hear your questions uh, and, and answer I'll answer them more fully um, so i'm going to go to to a question here uh, from one delegate so shannon it's so in, so enlightening to listen to your story because it's because of the sole fact that it's so realistic Hearing about your ups and downs is really inspiring. I'd love to ask you, how do you motivate yourself to get back up when you face the downs? Um, over the years, my process is this. Uh, when bleep hits the fan, um, I actually give myself time and I crawl into my bed and I'm in fetal position. So I'm like that and I give myself X amount of days. If the process is, you know, you drink a little bit, you talk to, you're on the phone, you're crying, whatever it may be. For me, I don't do the talking. I wanna be alone and I'm in fetal position. And then slowly when I feel, you know, of course your brain is racing and everything. Then at one point it's like, okay, you come on, get up, you know? So um, 
And again, it goes back to the point where this is not going to be me forever. Like, I know this is not going to be perpetual. Like, I'm not going to be that person. I am not that person that lies in bed forever for three years, right? So um, I'm a bit too hyper for that. And if not, try matcha tea. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so then my process is I get out. I do I do my sketchbook. If I, do, if I can't take a trip out to the beach, I, I still do that. I have to self-reflect. I then try to research, talk to a lot of people. Maybe you don't feel like talking, but frankly, I, I know that whenever I start talking to a bunch of people in the field um, that I'm trying to get into, maybe you don't know that and you just wanna reflect on the, the, the issues that you have, that's also great as well. But sometimes just to, I'm a big believer of talking and communicating and hearing other people's stories and sharing. Like the more, um, I think one of the reasons why I feel that okay, my stuff and my issues aren't too bad is because over the past 43 years, I'm a talker and I'm a listener and I, I try to understand where different people come from. And when I hear different people's case studies, I don't feel so alone, you know? And so I don't feel like it's so much a big mountain of a problem that it cannot be solved. Like other people has done it, so why can't I? And so, yeah. yeah. Great, great stuff, Shannon. I'm um, going to get to another question here. Love your story about finding your ikigai. In your opinion, is it really possible for an individual to do well in their professional career and to do good in NGOs, et cetera, at the same time? If you want to make money, <laughs> I'm going to throw one more thing in there. Like if you're already well-to-do and then you're in an NGO, like great. But for me, I don't come from that kind of money, right? So I, for me, it needs to be do well in, in the work, social mission and make money, right? And I believe that you can, um, but my, I don't think you can in an NGO just because you're not going to be able to sustain. Like That's just my personal reflection, which is why whatever I do in any kind of business, I try to make sure it's business led and then make sure that, you know, I build in the fundamentals of the social values and, and whatever I can do inside it as well. So I, I'm kind of marrying the two, but it is really hard. Social entrepreneurs, I, I mentor a lot of social entrepreneurs. And frankly, sometimes it's like, you see, you see capitalists and then you see tree huggers. So the tree huggers don't know anything about business and these business people don't incorporate it in. So it's really difficult at times. I do see um, because of the monetary and, and you know money generating issue. Uh, so my answer is it's tough if it's an NGO, but if it's a business with social focus led, then okay. Great, super, super. Um, uh, going to be one or two more. Um, just noticed that the 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 note that I thought I sent into the uh, chat wasn't there, so I'm just going to send that clubhouse link so you can guys can copy that and uh, hopefully we'll hear from you, hear your voices and more of your questions. Get to more of your questions in half an hour on there. Um, so I'm going to do one or two more questions uh, now, Shan, just as we're coming to time. Um, okay, very, there, there are two. So one, one um, very briefly is, are there any Thai core values that you embrace and, and uphold which shaped your, your decisions, um, milestone, milestone decisions up to now? So Thai core values? Thai yeah, core Thai values? Core. Um, Okay, this is variation. I, I do love respect, um, uh, but I will say something that might be a little controversial. I don't like respect if it's like entitled. Like, you know, I work with a lot of politicians and, um, and frankly, before I was 40 or maybe 38, I uh, used to be like, oh, kowtow to them, oh, kah, okay, so what do you kah, you know, and stuff like that. And, and frankly, sometimes they don't even know what they're talking about, right? Okay, fine. Okay, there's respect. They're older, the seniority and stuff, but that doesn't always entitle you to um, condescending or disrespect to people. And I know a, a bunch of like, this is this has happened to me and my colleagues a lot. Like they go, oh, you go get the coffee. I'm like, hey, look, I, I earned my place to be here, you know? And so it's just this Thai thing, very Asian thing. And I think that um, in the beginning, I really 
took that in offense and I didn't like it and I did what they did. But I think as I got older, um, you know, walking into a business government building with like hair like this, like they, and, and talking like this, I, I think I've already gotten to a certain level where I feel that it's okay. I'm still giving them the respect by talking to them frank and straightforward without having to kowtow, you know, like without having to, oh my God, you're the... So, so respect, I think, is still great um, because I feel that sometimes in the Western world, we don't get, it, we're a bit out there, you know, like, um, but yeah, that, that's probably one main core value I, I do really like. Great stuff. There's one that I, I, I'll, I'll mention to you now, but we won't have time to, to do it. Uh, but I, I'd love for you to have a think about that and share that in the clubhouse later. Um, uh, hi, Shannon. Uh, greetings from Cambodia. I'm loving this session uh, so much because it's so raw and so real. Do you have a favorite quote? So, so have a think about that. We'll cover that in um, clubhouse in, in half an hour or so. Um, okay. Favorite quote. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time um, over there in Bangkok. Uh, it's been a, it's been such a, as, as our uh, friend said from, from Cambodia, it's been so raw and so real. And, and I'm sure a lot of people have been able to really take a lot of strength from your words and uh, have a few tips on how to get through um, periods when we feel lost in our lives. And um, I'm sure you've also given a lot of strength to the females in, in the audience. Um, I'd love to, uh, to, to thank you very much. Um, and uh, just on a final note, uh, just a final note, I, I, I would describe you as, to give the technical term, uh, a badass in some sense. <laughs> um, uh, your clubhouse profile, I think it says, love life, love life and rock on. Um, so <laughs> the final advice for, for delegates who um, may need a bit more confidence and, and um, ability to speak out uh, as they may be still building that, um, and, and in Asia, uh, people tend to be less outspoken with, and more going with the flow, which is not quite like you. Um, what would your final piece of advice be for, for people in that, in that respect? Yeah, I think, I think um, maybe I have two things on my side, which was um, I am an extrovert and I did grow up in the States and I am the eldest of, of two others, so a total of three. Um, but I think the main thing was my parents, uh, even though they're Asian, they really gave me the platform to speak. And um, my dad did it. I think my dad thinks I'm a boy. Like he, um, and I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing or whatever, but he really doesn't see gender when he talks to me. And he's just like, you could do it, Shannon. Just, just say it. And then he just, it just gives me like things to do. And um, I was doing presentations and typing his dissertation when I was like 12. So I think um, to be given these opportunities, they actually help you find your voice and, and you, and of course, don't worry about not finding your voice in the beginning, but you do have to put yourself out there. You still have, you should talk to your parents, just be like, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to find my voice if you keep, you know, pressuring me. I need you to work with me, to give me, you know, to open up and give me that platform because a lot of it does come back to our parents and, and our surroundings. Um, you could always surround yourselves with great friends and, and extroverted people and whatnot, but but you know, maybe have that heart to heart with, with your parents and just be like, hey, I need this. This is something that I wanna work on. Um, and then you will find your voice, whether it be the 20s or 30s or 40s. I mean, um, just keep working on it, listen to yourself, find out which voice, what you do that makes you feel confident in what you do. And that's when you feel a bit more confident about speaking out right. So good luck. Right. I had, I had a great time, Julian, and thank you everybody here who hopefully if you join us on Clubhouse, amazing. Um, and if not, I hope that the mix of both life failures and challenges and work challenges, I guess the reason why in the beginning I dabbled on a lot of failures in the beginning is because 
maybe that's closer to where you're at. The 20s to 30s is, 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 is scary sometimes. And it doesn't, don't worry because I failed a lot and yet I've come here. And so, and, and there's so many other people who have failed more and gone more than me. So don't worry. And just as long as you pick yourself up, you, you build your own process, you can do it. Enjoy the um, coming sessions at HPA. Um, been great to be here with you, uh, Shannon, and um, see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.